confidence intervals. Right. So we talk about confidence intervals. All right. So essentially, the question I want to ask is the following. Right. So if you think about it, what we are doing is right. We are trying to estimate some some parameter, some performance measure by looking at some statistics that we compute on a sample of size n. Right. So that's basically what we are trying to do. We're trying to uh, measure some performance based on a statistic in a sample of size n. Right. So I am doing this repeatedly, right? Suppose I have done this with one sample, and I have some number. Let's say x bar. Okay, let's say that is my average error or average whatever. Okay, I am giving you some performance measure x bar, right? So in what fraction of samples of size n, right? I draw this x bar, and then I'll give you some. Interval around x bar, so right. And right. I'll give you some interval x bar minus epsilon and x bar plus epsilon, right? So, and there is some true performance measure I don't know called x star, right? So ideally, I would want to give you this plus and minus epsilon. Such that x star lies somewhere in this interval, right? Right. So I, I give you not x bar. I give you x bar plus or minus epsilon, such that with a high probability, I want my x star to lie within that interval. Okay. So in fact, the confidence interval, essentially the the amount of confidence you have in this interval, essentially means the following. Okay. In what fraction of the samples of size n that I draw. Suppose I, I keep drawing samples of size n, and I tell you that I have give you a 95% confidence interval. Right? So what does this mean? X star exactly. In 95 sam 95% of samples of size n, x star will lie within. The x bar would lie within plus. X star would lie within. <laughs> Plus or minus epsilon of x bar, right? So, right? You understood what I said, right? In 95 percent of the samples of size n, right, x star will lie within plus or minus epsilon of x bar. Okay. Is it the same thing as saying that with 95 percent probability, x star is within plus or minus epsilon of x bar? No, why? Because I am talking about samples of size n here, right? So depending on my sample size, my sample is very, 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 very large, right? Then possibly this will approach that probability. I am talking about samples of size n, okay? So whenever I give you a, a confidence interval, remember that it really doesn't mean, even though people often mistake it for the probability of x bar being within epsilon of x star is really not the case. What it really means is if you repeat this with samples of size n, right, in 95 percent of the samples x star will lie within epsilon of x bar, okay. Some kind of an assurance, right, but not. Suppose I want to reduce the confidence interval, what does it mean? Sorry? No, what does it mean to reduce the sampling? Uh, I mean confidence interval. Reduce, reduce the epsilon, right? I want to reduce the epsilon. I want to make it smaller, right? So when I say reduce the confidence interval, I really mean that. Okay, I want this as opposed to that, right? If I want to do that, what is the best way to do it? Increase the sample size, n, right?
Okay, so if I want a 95 percent confidence interval, right? So what would that be? We looked at some magic numbers in the last class. Entries from the Z. So, we cannot use the standardized uh, thing here because we really need to give actual values here, right. So, we cannot use the, the, the standard normal Gaussian. So, it has to be 1.96 into sigma x bar. So, it is 1.96 because it is 2.5 that side, 2.5 this side, right. So, it is 1.96, right. So, if I want a tighter uh, confidence interval, right, then essentially I have to reduce the sigma. Right, this is assuming that your n is fairly large, right. If your n is very, very small, then you have to use the t distribution. You cannot use 1.96, you have to use the corresponding statistics from the appropriate entry in the t table. So, appropriate table, fine, appropriate row in the t table corresponding to the degrees of freedom, right. So, so typically for n greater than 20, right, you can use even something simpler 1.96 or even 2 times sigma is good enough. Okay. So, related to the confidence interval, right, you also have this notion of any idea what error bars are? Huh? What is it? Somebody said something? Remember standard errors? What is the standard error? Huh? Yeah, but what is it? I mean, it is the it's the variance the of the, the, the standard sample. deviation in the sampling distribution. Right? That's why that's what we call the standard error. So error bars are essentially things that you plot around your estimates so that it tells you what is a what is the variance that you are likely to see in the estimate that you are getting so typically what you do is right so you you make some estimates and then you try to make some plot right i'm varying some parameter then i say okay and that is how my performance varies right so instead of just plotting these points and trying to draw a curve Right, what I would like you to do is essentially give me a give me error bars around that, right. So, each of this point I would have run an experiment, I am varying some parameter here, right, and I am looking at the performance, right, some parameter, I do not care what it is, I am looking at the performance, and in each of this point I would have run an experiment, right. Well, let me Right, assuming they are all equidistant around the thing, right. Each of these I would have run some experiment and for each of those I can give you the standard error, right. So, I plot these error bars, okay. Now, the question that you have to ask is, okay, from let us say I have these values, some values beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, beta 4, right. So, I have just run it at some intermediate points I have these curves, right. So, can you tell me if beta 2 and beta 3, is there any difference in the performance between beta 2 and beta 3? Not really because my error bars overlap significantly, right. I cannot be sure if there is a difference between the performance of beta 2 and beta 3 just on evidence of this curve alone, right. What about beta 1 and beta 2? No, right? Beta one and beta two. Also, I cannot say that there is a actually a difference. What about beta one and beta three? Barely. 
beta 1 and beta 4 surely. What about beta 3 and beta 4? Not really, right? So, I mean, so yeah, it's the, when the means are different, if I had just gone by means, I would have probably said that beta 4 gives me better performance than beta 3. But on the evidence of the experiments that you have run so far, I cannot conclude that because the error bars significantly overlap, right. So, this is why whenever you are running empirical studies, you are always supposed to plot these error bars. If you just give me an average performance, right, it is not at all clear. So, if I am comparing two things, then I can run your two uh, t test and so on and so forth, but this gives you a rough idea of which of the performances are actually different. So, beta 1 and beta 4 are certainly different, right, beta 4 is certainly better than beta 1. So, for the other things, evidence is kind of shaky. Sorry? That means beta 1, beta 2, beta 3 will all have the same value in this case. They could. They could. So, the way for you to verify this is now go run more experiments with beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, try to see if you can get a better estimate, right. Because as you know that, so with the, you know the true estimate could be anywhere in this interval, right. So, with, 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 I mean with 95 percent of the cases. Right, the true estimate could be anywhere in this interval. So, what I do is I run more experiments. So, if I run more experiments with beta 1, I might actually see that my mean shifts here, right, and my confidence interval becomes much narrower. Right, but now remember this is not the same confidence interval as before because this is a confidence interval of a larger sample size. So, you cannot directly compare these two, okay, it is a confidence interval of a larger sample size. So, I might actually rerun the experiment. And this might be the values I end up with. Let me see if that is a better color. Right, I have run the experiments again with a lot more data, and you can see that now things are a little clearer. So, beta 1, beta 2, there is really no difference, right? They are the same. Alternatively, beta 2 could have moved up, beta 1 could have moved down. I mean, could anything could have happened. I am just giving you an example here where now beta 1 and beta 2 are all more, most li more likely to be the same and beta 3 is now certainly better and beta 4 is certainly better than all the other 3 now. So, this could happen, one potential scenario. Another potential scenario is this could move down, this could move up, right. So, it could, the whole thing could change, right. Essentially, what the error bars tell you is what kind of conclusions can you draw from the experiments you have done so far. It could very well be that it is enough for you to find out which is the best beta. Right, beta 4 seems to be the best in terms of the experiments that you ran even the first time around. But if you want to produce a ranking among the betas, you will have to rerun the experiment. So, the, the only conclusion you can make from the previous experiment that you had was that beta 4 is probably the best beta, best value for beta. And if that is all you are interested in finding out, you can be happy with that experiment. But if you want to produce a relative ordering of the parameters, then you will have to be more careful. So, that is essentially the use of error bars, okay.